So I've got a couple of conflicts of interest to see. I've got some uh, industry collaborations, but none of these collaborations relate to the work I'm presenting today. So today I want to talk about androgen and energy balance. And I'd like to thank the organizers for allowing me to do this. Now, you heard that I work with, with women and sheep, and this is our research institute. And behind the research institute is a hospital. But I'm not actually talking about the hospital patients. Today, I'm going to talk about sheep. And when it comes down to the androgen part of, of, it, of this title, it's about polycystic ovary syndrome. And as Jenny said earlier on, that there's a Rotterdam criteria, but essentially, if you've got hyperandrogenism, it causes your ovaries to be polycystic. Androgens affect growing follicles, they pause growing follicles, and so you get oligoovulation and anovulation. So polycystic ovary syndrome, the cardinal feature is increased androgens. And with regards to the energy balance part, it's about obesity. What I want to do today is to talk about obesity and PCOS. Because PCOS is, is actually sort of important, and I don't need to reiterate that to this audience, but in the USA, in 2010, the PCOS-related health costs up to the age of 60 were more than 1.6 billion. And that's not about fertility treatment or hirsutism. That's about metabolic problems. And with regards to the metabolic problems, 80% of women with PCOS are overweight and obese. In the countries that like their fat and sugar, in Australia and the USA, two-thirds of women with PCOS are obese. And data coming out of the US is really quite worrying with regards to the sort of effect of that. 40% in one study developed gestational diabetes. By the age of 30, up to 10% were actually sort of diabetic, with a third of them with impaired glucose tolerance and a big conversion to diabetes. So the metabolic effects of polycystic ovary syndrome are really quite crucial with regards to sort of lifelong health. So what I wanted to do today was to say, why are women with PCOS more likely to be overweight and obese? To do that, we need to use sort of animal models because that means you can control energy input, control outtake. And so when we're talking about modeling PCOS, Jenny briefly mentioned that some of the models of PCOS, such as the primate model, have a very long gestational time. So what I wanted to do was use a model of PCOS which has a clinically realistic ovarian phenotype with multiple small, medium polyxanthal follicles containing a healthy oocyte and capable of resuming growth, a hormonal phenotype with normal FSH, normal estradiol, but increased LH action, and the metabolic phenotype with obesity, hyperinsulinemia, free fatty acids, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And when it comes down to that, I, I, it, pretty much based on the serendipitous model of PCOS in monkeys. Now, many years ago, there was a lot of discussion about gender effects in the neonate. And to do that, they were studying monkeys. And what happened was they gave pregnant female monkeys some androgens. Those monkeys gave birth. They checked the behavior of the infant and then retired these influence, infants to a monkey sanctuary. Over 20 years later, in that monkey sanctuary, the offspring were noted. Some of them were noted to have irregular periods. And if they looked at them in detail, they found that they were oligoovulatory or anovulatory with polycystic ovaries on the scan. They had increased androgens and increased um, sort of LH levels, including normal FSH and normal estradiol. And the metabolic effects of obesity, insulin resistance. And if those monkeys had come to see me in the clinic, I would have made the diagnosis of polycystic ovary syndrome. So these monkeys pretty much had all the features we would expect in polycystic ovary syndrome. They were genetically normal. They'd been exposed to a bit more androgen before they were born. Now, that might tell us something about what polycystic ovary syndrome involves and how it develops, but it also allows us to do some modeling. And there maybe is some evidence that androgens might have a role for the development of PCOS in women. We know that in the very early studies, 
where they were doing amniocentesis uh, in the 16 weeks of human pregnancy, they were trying to work out quickly whether it was a male or a female fetus. And they did that, they measured androgens. And guess what? Androgens are higher in the amniotic fluid of male fetuses. But if you actually looked at the levels, the levels in a female fetus were very, very wide, and about sort of a quarter of them had levels up in the male, le male range. So there's certainly a very variable exposure of androgens in utero. And if you look at the amniotic fluid testosterone concentrations with PCOS, they're higher. There's higher fetal androgens, there's higher cord blood androgens at birth. There's experiments of nature where women developed an androgen secreting tumor and then their children had higher levels of LH and more androgens. And there's also some evidence that uh, aromatase in the placenta is less expressed. So, I mean, I think that there is some evidence that regardless of where the androgen comes from, whether it's environmental, whether it's genetic, but there is some developmental origins of polycystic ovary syndrome. So I utilized that using a sort of a large animal model. And the sheep has a fetal development that's like the monkey, that's, that's like humans. So what we did was we gave uh, pregnant sheep some androgens by in depot injection, uh, allowed these sheep to lamb, and then followed the lamb up as it developed into adulthood. Now, with regards to the sheep models of PCOS, then the most standard model, the initial models that were developed, uh, gave the androgen from day 30 to day 90 of the 146, 147 gestation. Now, day 30 is before the sex programming window has finished, and so when you do that, you actually get a female sheep, and you can see this is a normal female sheep, and this is a prenatally androgenized female sheep with a scrotum and a, and a penis here, okay? Now, what we did was try to sort of avoid this sort of external masculinization involved with very early treatment, and so our androgen exposure starts after the sex programming window and around that mid-gestational time between 60 and day 100. And what, what happens? Well, what happens is these sheep get an ovarian phenotype. They, they ovulate normally during their first breeding season, and then they become progressively anovulatory, and they don't ovulate during their second breeding season. Actually very similar to what's seen if they're, they're, they're treated from day 30. What they also have is uh, increased LH, increased LH to FSH ratio, increased LH pulsatility, and if you take the theca cells out of these sheep and culture them, they express more of the genes that involve in androgen synthesis, you can see that down here, and also they make more androgens in, in, in vitro. I mean, so these sheep have got a hormonal phenotype, and when it comes to the metabolic phenotype, as these sheep grow, they become overweight, and they've got the hyperinsulinemic insulin resistant. So, using these sheep, the first thing we wanted to say was, can we get any insight into why these sheep become obese? This is interesting, because these sheep are obese and insulin resistant, but what's happening is, is that at birth, there is no difference in their birth weight. So this is not a catch-up growth phenomenon. This is not a thrifty phenotype programming. These sheep have got normal growth. They've got normal weights through, through puberty, and it's only in adulthood that you can begin to see the, the obesity. And so what happened was, is that we tried to get a handle on why these sheep were becoming overweight in adulthood. Now, when it comes down to sort of becoming the energy balance part of it, then clearly you take in food and you burn up energy. And if you become obese, then somewhere in that balance, there's a mismatch. And when it comes down to energy expenditure, actually only about 20% of your energy is expended by doing any form of exercise. If you look at the big red bar here, which is the most important element of energy expenditure, that's just by staying alive. So 65% of your energy is spent by staying alive. The blue bar here is about 15% of your energy expenditure. And what that is, it's adaptive thermogenesis. It's postpandial thermogenesis. Last night, I was out in Munich, and I had a big sausage fest of a meal. And then I went home and lay there sweating away, burning off all those calories. And that was my postprandial thermogenesis um, kicking in. 
So what happens if you look at energy expenditure in women with PCOS? Well, Steve Frank's group did that in 1982. What they did was they did indirect calorimetry in women with PCOS. And what you can see here is the energy expenditure in, in, in control women after, they, after they've been feeding, fed, and there's women with PCOS. And what you can see is they seem to burn less energy after eating. So what we decided to do was we decided to do that in the sheep. And what we did in the sheep was actually implant a, a, a thermometer into the, the fat on, on the back of the sheep. Now, we didn't want to do this at a time when the sheep had a different ovarian function because obviously the sheep are not ovulating. They won't have any progesterone. That might be an issue with regards to temperature. And also, as Jenny said, there may be ovarian factors that are involved. So sheep have got this sort of useful thing sometimes and unuseful thing another time where it's a seasonal. So what we did was we did this experiment when the sheep's ovaries were switched off. Okay? So the switch ovaries were switched off from a seasonal point of view. We put the thermometer in, we trained the sheep to expect some meals, and then what we did was we me measured their temperature, and that's what happened. So when you fed the sheep, if the sheep had seen uh, three years previously, before it was born, a little bit extra androgens, what it did was, after eating, it reduced the level of, 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 of temperature increase. Okay? And actually, if you look, if you compare that with what's seen in women with PCOS, it looks remarkably similar. And more interestingly, if you actually look at the data points uh, between this is on here, this is the women with PCOS from Steve Frank's study, the, these are the sheep. And if you convert them to the same, so if you make control sheep 100, the, the, the level of postprandial thermogenesis uh, is very similar in women and in sheep to be about 73, 74%. Now, if you look at the data here, that you can see that there's two graphs. The first graph, these are the women with PCOS that are obese, and these are the more lean PCOS. And so it does seem, by looking at it, that the effect is more significant, perhaps, in the obese sheep. So that leads to the question, is it just the obesity by itself that makes the sheep more likely to, to reduce the postprandial thermogenesis? So what we actually did was that we had a group of, of sheep from the same cohort that we, that we fed by diet intake to get them up to the same weight as the sheep with PCOS. And so what you've got is you've got a, a group of normal sheep that are exactly the same weight, the same adiposity as, as, as the group with PCOS. I'd like you to note that these are 80-odd kilogram sheep. These are adult size sheep that are weighing sort of over 80 kilograms. And what happened is that if you look at the changes in temperature and the time to reach sort of maximum temperature, what you see is that obesity had actually no effect by itself. The effect was all to do with the prenatal androgens. So what that told me is that when you're looking at energy balance in PCOS, there might well be this green area here, which is maybe 3 or 4% of the, the energy sort of expenditure that the women with PCOS have missing. And that means that women with PCOS either have to eat less or exercise more. And if they don't, then that mismatch by that 3 or 4% may well lead to overweight and obesity. So the next question is, why on earth might postprandial thermogenesis be different in the first place? So with regards to postprandial thermogenesis, the way that I think about it is that there must be some signaling pathways that are telling the sheep that it's, that it's eaten. The sheep will sense those signaling pathways, and then there will be some tissues which burn off the calories. Okay? And I started off by looking at the most obvious tissue to burn off the calories, which is the fat. And fat's a very sensible thing because we've heard a lot about brown adipose tissue and we've heard a lot about sort of the, the uncoupling proteins in brown adipose tissue which burn off the calories. Now rodents have got lots of brown adipose tissue and that's because rodents are tiny and they get cold very, very quickly. So they need a lot of brown adipose tissue to keep them warm. 
We know that lambs, when they're born, have got brown adipose tissue for the same reason, just as human babies. But just like humans, when sheep grow up, they lose a lot of their brown adipose tissue. Now, in humans, if you put them in a fridge for a while, you can get some brown adipose tissue activity. And a sheep who pretty much live in a fridge for a while have developed a woolly coat. And so there's not a lot of brown adipose tissue in, in, in sheep. But what you can see here, these are the, the beige or, or, or bright adipose tissue. And what we wondered was, is there any changes in the level of white adipose tissue versus this slightly beige type of adipose tissue in these sheep? And what we did was we looked for markers of the bright or beige adipose tissue in the subcutaneous fat of our sheep. And what we could see was most of the time we didn't see much difference, but some of the genes that are associated with sort of, uh, more bright or beige change were reduced in the testosterone uh, sheep that were treated with testosterone before they were even born. And these are now three years old. Importantly, if you actually looked at the uncoupling proteins, and this just is in the, in the, the interscapular fat, what you can see is a trend for the, the uncoupling proteins. They're expressed at low levels, but these uncoupling proteins in that fat were reduced. There were slight differences depending on which fat depot you looked at. This is the neck fat, and you can see that in the neck fat we saw uncoupling protein one was significantly down, and that was exactly the same in the, in the groin fat. When it comes down to is this an effect of contemporary androgens, well, this is at a time when the sheep are, are, are switched off. The sheep don't have any ovarian function, but we know that their adrenal androgens are slightly higher. So we gave sort of entirely normal sheep androgens for two weeks to look to see if we could see any differences in the expression of these genes and didn't see anything. So it seems that there is definitely some changes in the adipose tissue in these sheep three years after they were exposed to the androgens. With regards to the, the whole issue of, of how the adipose tissue can be switched on to burn off calorie, one of the big thing is adrenergic nervous system. And so what we did was is that we postulated that maybe if there's a problem with the, with the, the sensing, the nerve uh, stimulation of the adipocytes might be less. And to do that, we looked at the sympathetic stimulation of our various fat depots, and, and consistently what we saw is reduced noradrenaline levels within the tissue. And that correlated with the difference in postprandial inc increase in temperature. So our thinking was that maybe there is something going on in, during the development of the fat which is changing the way that the, the fat is set up in the first place. And when you look at various different factors involved in development, the one that caught our eye was FGF21, because FGF21 is a liver protein that certainly has some activity in the development of, of adipose tissue, and particularly the browning of some adipose tissue. So what we did was we looked at FGF21 in our sheep because FGF21, as we know, improves sensitivity of insulin, decreases body weight, promotes energy expenditure, and if you don't have any FGF21, you've got an increased body weight. And in our sheep, and this is when they've got a normal body weight, when the fat is developing, and if you were at the, sort of the talk today with um, Cassia, uh, gave, she would demonstrate very clearly that there were some dead changes in the development of fat in the subcutaneous adipose tissue in these prenatally programmed sheep. And what we could see was is that the fat expression in, the, in the, the FGF21 expression in the liver was significantly down, and this was mirrored in the serum. Now, FGF21 works on adipocytes. It binds to the FGF receptor and also the beta-clotho co-receptor, and that beta-clotho co-receptor is reduced in the subcutaneous adipose tissue in adolescence when these cells are developing. FGF21 stimulates PPAR gamma. PPAR gamma expression is reduced in these cells, and the protein is not quite significantly reduced in the adipocytes. We know that PPAR gamma then will simulate adiponectin. We know that adiponectin in the um, gene expression is reduced, and the adiponectin protein in the fat is, is almost significantly reduced. So there's certainly something about the setup of the fat, and perhaps FGF21's got a role. 
But the major factor that we wanted to look at was insulin. And the thing about insulin that made us want to look at it is because our sheep are insulin resistant and they become insulin resistant around puberty. And when Steve Franks looked at what correlated with the changes in postprandial thermogenesis in the women with PCOS, what he showed very clearly was an association with insulin sensitivity with the, with the effect of postprandial thermogenesis. And what we do is we see exactly the same in the sheep. It's plotted in a slightly different way, but essentially the, more, the higher your insulin, the more likely you are to have a, a reduced temperature increase. Okay? So it certainly seems that the whole hyperinsulinemia is very much linked to the reduction in postprandial thermogenesis. Now, we know that hyperinsulinemia occurs in adolescence before obesity is seen. And if you actually look at the pancreas in adolescence, what you'll find is you'll find if you count the beta cells, you'll see quite a significant increase in the beta cells of the pancreas before you see any changes in body weight and before you see any, any obesity. And if you actually sort of look at the beta cell count, it correlates to the, to the amount of insulin that's there. So that's not just the case in a sheep model. The exact same thing happens in the primate model, where very on, sort of around puberty, what you're seeing is increased amount of beta cells in the pancreas. And that led me to believe we are giving androgens before birth. Maybe all we're doing is just masculinizing the pancreas. And if you look at the pancreas, what you find is that, that males have got more beta cells in the pancreas uh, than, than females. And this is in fetal life and in, in early life. So what you see is that when you're giving androgens, what you're doing is just increasing the, the beta cells uh, in the pancreas. So that led me to postulate that maybe the pancreas thinks it's a male pancreas rather than a female pancreas. And we know that there's very interesting effects of androgens in males and females. So if you give androgens to female, they become insulin resistant and have a metabolic deterioration. But if you've got a man who's a bit insulin resistant uh, with a metabolic, you know, bad metabolic picture, and you give him androgens, he seems to get a bit better. And therefore, I had this wacky thought that perhaps women with PCOS are just sort of like hypoandrogenic men, and if you actually gave them more androgens, they might actually get better. So we can test that, because women are not keen on taking androgens, but you can test that in our sheep model. So what we did was we tested it in our sheep model. And what that, this shows is that if you give uh, normal females, these are just entirely normal females, androgens just for two weeks, they do become insulin resistant. They become at about the same level of insulin resistance as our prenatally programmed sheep. Okay? If you give a prenatally programmed sheep androgens, they don't get any better. But actually, they don't get any worse either, which is quite, quite interesting. These are hypogonadal male sheep, but they're quite young, and we didn't see any difference there. But actually, the, the pancreas in the female sheep is not equivalent to a male pancreas. And I want to just use this slide to briefly demonstrate that. Because what you see is, you see, if you look at the number of beta cells, you see that, that the female beta cells, once you give them androgens, they increase to a male level, and there's no differences if you give the male extra androgens. We know that if you, if you look at alpha cells, there is no change in the number of alpha cells, but males have more alpha cells than females. And therefore, if you look at the alpha cell to beta cell ratio in the pancreas, control males and control females and androgen-treated males all have pretty much the same one-to-one -one ratio, whereas the testosterone females have, have got a much reduced alpha cell to beta cell ratio. So I just wanted to finish up by saying, is this all androgens? Because what we are actually doing is we are giving our sheep testosterone. And that means that, one, that we don't know quite how much androgen is getting into the fetus. Two, there is aromatization, and so that testosterone will be converted into uh, estrogen, and so therefore the fetus will see estrogen as well. Three, there's an effect on the mother. If you give androgens, the mother's glucose might go up a little bit, and that glucose might 
cause some programming. Also, the mothers, when they're getting androgen, become a little bit more aggressive, and that might cause them to be a bit stressed. So what we then did to try to dissect the role of androgens was to directly inject steroids into the fetus. And what we can see here is this is just looking at the, at, at the pancreas. These are, are, are adult, uh, these are adolescent sheep, and what you can see that it's only testosterone that, that um, causes any difference in the, in the insulin secretion from the pancreas. And when it comes down to the beta cells, alpha beta cell ratio, we don't see any difference with in estrogen or glucocorticoid, although there is some differences perhaps with the number of beta cells with, with glucocorticoids. So I wanted to finish today by saying that large animal models can probably offer additional insights into PCOS. Yes, they take a long time to happen, but they can be clinically realistic. I believe that PCOS is associated with reduced postprandial thermogenesis and that that is a driver towards obesity in women with PCOS. It's manifest by altered subcutaneous adipose tissue function. And that is linked to insulin sensitivity. Our insulin sensitivity is linked to the reduction in energy expenditure. And that this reduced thermogenesis it's prenatally programmed, but it is manifest in, in adulthood. And certainly there's a lot of things happening at adolescence before you see the later obesity. And that might suggest that there's a window in the postnatal period where there can be an intervention that might change the sensitivity or, to postprandial thermogenesis, which is being programmed around adolescence. So I'd like to um, sort of acknowledge sort of uh, my collaborators, some PhD students were involved, uh, particularly Cassia. And Cassia has been very much involved in all this research. And I was at a very interesting talk on bone marrow fat yesterday. And afterwards I said, that was really interesting. Have we looked at bone marrow fat? And, you know, because we collected it. And she said, we haven't done anything. I have done all these things. <laughs> so I need to thank Cassia for doing that. Thanks very much.